Thank you. Please be seated. All right, counsel, you wanted to approach before he brought the jury in.
the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. The state may call its next witness. The state calls Kevin Horn. Dr. Horn, please take the stand. You were previously sworn in this matter. You are still under oath. Do you understand? I do. Your name, sir? Kevin Horn. And you're the individual that conducted the medical examination or autopsy of uh, Travis Alexander's body, correct? Yes. And one of the things that you were able to determine was that there was a gunshot wound, correct? Yes. Taking a look at Exhibit 207, is this the gunshot wound that you found? It is. In terms of this particular gunshot wound, what organ did it strike and what effect would it have had on Mr. Alexander? if that had been the first injury to his body? It uh, passed through the front of the right side of his skull and would have injured the right frontal lobe of his brain and would have been uh, very rapidly incapacitating. When you say very rapidly in incapacitating, what does that mean if you, uh, to those of us that are not in the medical profession? Would he have gone down? Would he have stood there? Would he have crawled? What would, would, have, what would have happened? Uh, he may have been able to take a step or two, probably would have collapsed and lost consciousness uh, within seconds. And as a result of this particular injury, if this was the first injury, would he have been able, after two seconds, to attempt to hold on to somebody, whoever may have been there, for example, the defendant, would he have been able to do that had that been the first event or the first injury? I don't believe so, no. Why not? Again, because of the, uh, the injury, and it's not just the passage of the projectile through the brain, but it's also the shock wave of the projectile passing through with velocity and injuring that structure. So it would have been a neurologic shock, uh, incapacitation, unconsciousness. After this had happened, would he have been able to, let's say after more than the two seconds that you've indicated, would he have any knowledge or would he be cognizant of his surroundings such that he would have been able to um, attempt to defend himself. Objection, speculation. Overruled. I don't believe so, no. Why not? Again, because of the uh, injury to the brain, uh, the, the information processing part of the brain um, would have rendered him unable to raise his hands to offer any sort of purposeful action uh, or to verbalize anything. Again, what if this shot would have been the first event and he is down for two or three seconds? What if the indication were that there was a period of time in which his assailant went to, for example, the bedroom and the nightstand specifically to pick up a knife and then come back? If that would have happened and that would have been done in rapid succession, maybe 10 seconds later, would Mr. Alexander have had the mental capacity to move his hands and attempt to grab at, at anything that was coming towards him? No. So if we take a look at exhibits numbers 174, what are we looking at here? The back of his right hand. And do we see any injuries there? No. Exhibit 175, what are we looking at there? Again, the back of the right hand. Do we see any injuries there? No. Exhibit 176, what do we see here? Palm of the right hand. And do we see any injuries there? I don't see any, no. And exhibit number 177, finally, what are we looking at there? There's another view of the right hand uh, showing the tip of the thumb, and there is an inside injury of the thumb. And this would be right here, correct? Yes. And is this something that you've termed previously as a defensive wound? Yes, it's consistent with that. And what does that mean to be a defensive wound? That means that the, uh, the decedent attempted to raise their hand and uh, grab the weapon or was struck by the we weapon while it was being wielded against him. But if the shot would have been the first thing that happened and there would have been a period of, let's say, three seconds or maybe five seconds, 
that went by, would Mr. Alexander have been conscious to be able to raise his right hand in a defensive posture? I don't believe so, no. Take a look at Exhibit 178. What are we looking at there? It's the back of the left hand. And do we see any injuries there that could have been inflicted by an eye? No. Exhibit number 179. That is another view of the back of the hand with the thumb extended. What are these things here? Those are sharp force injuries. So those are injuries that we are beginning to look at, correct? Yes. And Exhibit 180, what do they show? Uh, incised or sharp force injuries of the palm and the edge of the thumb. And again, you termed these defensive wounds previously, correct? Yes. What does that mean in terms of the consciousness, whether or not Mr. Alexander was conscious at the time that these were inflicted? Well, it's a purposeful action, so he'd have to get his hands up and try to grab the knife, and with the head wound, I don't think that's possible. It is impossible if the gunshot was the first thing, correct? Objection Sustained. If the gunshot were the first injury, would it be possible to have these type of injuries on his hand? I don't believe so. Then we take a look at uh, exhibit number 182. What are we looking at there? That is the uh, lateral edge of the uh, left hand, again showing the incised injuries, very deep incised injuries of the back of the thumb. And exhibit 183. It's a close-up view of the incised wound of the back of the thumb. Are these also these uh, defensive wounds that you previously talked about? Yes. If the gunshot had been the first shot, and this was to have occurred maybe five, six, seven, eight seconds later, would Mr. Alexander have been conscious or have, so that he would have been able to raise his hands in a defensive posture? No. If the gunshot wound was the first wound, would, and again, the, the, after the one or two seconds that you talked about have elapsed, would Mr. Alexander have had the capacity after the first two or three seconds to get on all fours and begin to crawl away? No, I don't think so. Why not? Again, that's a purposeful action. requires uh, normal brain function to be able to do that. Would he, if he were down on the ground and this period has elapsed of one or two seconds, would he, if he were on his back, would he then be able to turn himself so that he would be on his face or the front portion of his body? Could he make that purposeful action after, say, five seconds? Not as a purposeful action, but if he's having convulsions, he may have ended up in that position. So, for example, if we take a look at Exhibit 184, this is, what are we looking at here? Stab and incise wounds at the front of his torso and a wound of his neck. And if the gunshot wound were the first event, you, are you saying that this could have happened and then he would have turned such that 192 could have happened? Only if he's in the midst of convulsions. I don't think in a purposeful way, no. And how long do these convulsions last or is there any indication how long they can last? I couldn't say. What about the situation if, again, assuming that the gunshot wound was the first event and that you've already told us that after a couple of seconds, Mr. Alexander would not be able to engage in purposeful action, correct? Yes. Would he be able to get up after the gunshot wound and after the two seconds and walk approximately five feet and stand at a sink and sort of hover over it? Would he be able to do that? I don't believe so, no. And again, why not? Again, it's a purposeful action. It requires coordination of multiple muscles to be able to stand and walk. And uh, with a head injury, a brain injury, I don't think he's going to be able to do that. And would he be able to walk approximately 12 feet, 6 inches down a hallway if the gunshot wound had occurred another maybe 6 or 8 feet away? There's the gunshot wound. He goes, as you indicated, he would go down. Would he then be able to walk, get up and walk, go to the sink, and then ambulate down the hallway if the gunshot wound were the first event? No. And Exhibit 205, in terms of this being inflicted at the end of the hallway, would, again, would he be able to, well, was this inflicted while he was still alive? 
Yes, I believe so. So would he have been able to, if the gunshot wound was the first event, would he have been able to ambulate approximately 18 feet, walk down the hallway, stop at the sink, go all the way down to the hallway, if the gunshot wound would have been the first? No. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Morning. In your time as a medical examiner, you've done over 6,000 autopsies, haven't you? Something like that. So, a lot. Yes. And in, in those autopsies, you've included, you've dealt obviously with gunshot wounds, haven't you? Yes. And would you characterize many of them have dealt with gunshot wounds? Yes. And in dealing with gunshot wounds, you're familiar then with a 25 caliber weapon being a lower caliber weapon, right? Yes. And as a lower caliber weapon, that means it doesn't have as much power, right? That's the usual case, yes. As a higher caliber weapon. Yes. And in fact, in this case, we know that um, there was an entry wound, right? Yes. But there was no exit wound. Right. So not enough power. It was stopped by the bone, right? Yes. Um, and if the gunshot wound was uh, done when uh, Mr. Alexander was just a few feet away from the gun itself, uh, presumably there would be more power coming from the gun closer to the gun than further away from the gun, right? It would lose velocity with distance, yes. Okay. And so, uh, but here we see that it didn't have enough velocity to even make it an exit wound, right? Right. And there was, um, if we assume that the gunshot wound was the first wound that was inflicted, okay? You would agree that, that it would not be immediately fatal, right? Probably rapidly fatal. Um, maybe not immediately, but certainly incapacitating very quickly. What's the difference between immediate and rapid? Immediate is within a second, the person drops and they're dead. Uh, okay. And rapid would be seconds to minutes, depends on your definition. Okay. Well, so you, so you, would, say that, that, so you would say that it would be immediately fatal? Incapacitating. Incapacitating. Okay. Um, you know that we know based on the, uh, your autopsy results that the bullet went uh, over top of his mouth area, right? Yes. And it went through the sinus cavity? Into the sinus, yes. And when it, a bullet goes into the sinus, then it's going to cause bleeding where it goes, right? Usually. And that bleeding into the sinus will lead into the nose and mouth, right? Yes, it can. And so typically, once there's bleeding into the nose and mouth, we would expect to see blood then coming, uh, being sprayed out of the nose if there's any type of force behind it, like coughing it out or something like that. Yes. Uh, isn't it? Well. You're aware that Detective Flores said that you told him the bullet wound was not immediately incapacitating. Objection. Overall, do me answer. I don't recall that, no. Okay. Are you aware that Detective Flores said that, um, that you told him, in particular, that the gunshot would not have completely incapacitated someone? Sustained. And according to you, you don't recall having any conversation with Detective Flores, is that right? That's right. Uh, ever, after the autopsy? No. And you obviously weren't here when Detective Flores testified in another hearing besides trial, right? You weren't sitting here watching him testify? I wasn't present. So you weren't present to hear what he had to say about what you told him? That's right. And. But you'd agree with me, though, right, that you've said once before, in, in this case, I don't think it would have immediately incapacitated him or killed him, but it would be a serious injury. Didn't you tell us that? 
I don't recall saying that. All right. Do you recall when you testified, and this would have been on January 8th of 2013 in front of this jury, we were talking about some of the things that Detective Flores had said that you had told him. And I asked you, and do you remember telling Detective Flores that you knew this because the gunshot wouldn't have completely incapacitated someone? And you told us, I don't recall saying that either. Does that sound familiar? That's what I'm saying today, too, yes. Okay. And then I asked you, is that something that you think you would have never said to Detective Flores? And you answered, I think I have said it here in court. I don't think it would have immediately incapacitated him or killed him, but it would be a serious injury. I think in my very next line of testimony, I corrected my own misstatement that I do think it's immediately incapacitating, but not immediately fatal. So, so when you told this jury that it was not immediately incapacitating, that was a mistake on your part? I immediately corrected my testimony in the testimony, yes. So it was a mistake? It was a misstatement, yes. Okay. And when you make a misstatement, do you recall talking about the fact that the brain was liquefied? Uh, softened, yes. Okay. Well, do you remember telling this jury last time you testified that it was liquefied? I don't remember using that word. Okay. And do you remember then correcting that misstatement once, once we then talked about how you were able to take serial slices of the brain? Uh, yeah, in this case, uh, with a very decomposed brain, you can section it, but it has the consistency of an appearance of pudding. So, I mean, you can still take sections through it. So and you did that, right? Yes. You did sections. You as took much, sections. As much as I could, yes. Okay. Well, in, as much as you could, though, when you were able to take sections, though, in those sections, you were able, there, there was no damage that you could see, right? Right. And in my report, I say it's limited by decomposition. But you also tell us in your report that there was no damage that you can see in the brain. That's right, because of decomposition. And you also tell us that there's no trauma, there's no foreign bodies, and you couldn't see any pre-existing natural disease, right? Right. So you were able to tell all of that in the brain that you were able to section off or cut sections up. I was able to state that the brain is decomposed and it limits the examination, but because of where the holes in the skull are, the brain has to have been injured. But okay. I can't see the track through the brain now because of the decomposition. Right. And so basically, you're hypothesizing, aren't you? Because the holes in the skull, you're guessing that the bullet went through the brain, right? It had to have gone through the brain. It's simple geometry. Okay. But simple geometry doesn't tell you exactly where it went, right? I know where it went. It went right through the frontal lobe of the brain. Because exactly. there are two holes in the skull, and there's brain in between. Just because I can't see the track now doesn't mean that the bullet didn't pass through that spot. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. What I'm asking you, though, is the fact that you can't tell us exactly where it went through the brain, right? Because you, you see no damage in the brain that tells you that. Right. Because of decomposition now, I cannot see a wound track through the brain. Okay. And so you have, and there's, even though there was decomposition, it was enough for you to tell us that you were able to tell that there was no foreign material in the brain, right? Right. And even though there was decomposition in the brain, you were able to tell us that there was no pre-existing natural disease in the brain. Based on that examination and the limitations that are inherent in that examination. But you were able to tell us that, right? Right. I did not see any tumors or anything like that, yes. Okay. And you know that there was a wound to the superior vena cava, right? Yes. And that was one of the stab wounds that went just to, is it just to the left, set, left of center of a person's body? Again, I'm Are referring you, to my report. I'd, sure. Do you would rather I use the one that's in evidence or I brought my own copy? You can look at your own copy. It's on the, uh, just to the right of the midline of the chest. Okay. And that particular wound is um, that particular wound has an undermined lower edge. Is that right? Yes. OK. And so when something has an undermined lower edge, that means that tells you that the blade is angled slightly upward as it's going in, right? Yes. And if it's angled slightly upward, that means that we're talking about somebody having a knife going from down to up, right? Uh, with the body placed in standard position, yes. OK. And generally speaking, that can happen when a pers the person with the knife is shorter 
than the person who's receiving the wound. Overruled. Yes. Thank you. No, no further questions. Redirect. Sir, is there a difference between uh, a wound being rapidly fatal and uh, a wound being, or an injury being rapidly incapacitating? Yes. What is the difference? Uh, we see a lot of people who have traumatic injuries who end up dying in the hospital months later, but they're immediately unconscious or brain dead. So they're not, it's, it's not immediately fatal, but it's incapacitating. In this particular case, was this gunshot to the head, was it, in your opinion, did it render the victim immediately unconscious? Probably, yes. And by probably, huh, are we looking at seconds or what are we looking at? Overruled. Uh, well, it certainly altered consciousness and lack of purposeful uh, action, so within seconds. And you indicated or were asked about the track of the bullet that may have gone through the brain. And you mentioned something about the frontal lobe. What is it that the frontal lobe does with regard to the body or the individual? And what are the consequences of having a bullet rip through it? Well, it's a center of judgment. It's higher functions of the brain. Um, it's motivation, things of that nature. And uh, just because the bullet is passing through the frontal lobe, it doesn't imply that that's the only part that it would affect because there is a shock wave associated with that projectile. So it's going to affect other parts of the brain as well. So when you say there's a shock component to it, what are we talking about? Uh, as the bullet passes through the head, um, there's, there's going to be kinetic energy associated with it because it's, it's being shot with velocity. And when, usually when it passes through bone, it will also deform the projectile and the pr projectile will start to tumble. And so that will create a, a fairly large uh, wound track uh, rather than just a straight shot through the head. Based on what you found, the, the, the uh, round that was inside the head, the entry, the skull that was involved, do you have an opinion as to what direction or what path this bullet may have traveled? I passed uh, across the right frontal lobe. I do believe it passed through the right frontal lobe of the brain um, from the skull, forehead, downward into the left cheek. And was it, according to you, or in your opinion, was it immediately uh, incapacitating? Objection, asking answer. Overruled. Yes. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Looks like we have one juror question. Are there any other juror questions? Dr. Horan, the jurors have some questions for you. I'm going to ask them in the order they were submitted. Jody stated she shot Travis in the middle of the bathroom. If that were true and he would have started bleeding from his nose and mouth, 
<clears throat> wouldn't there have been blood found in the middle of the bathroom floor? Normally, if you're <clears throat> shot in the brain, there, there's going to be blood associated with that, so there would be bleeding where the injury occurred. I would expect that, yes. Is it possible you could be wrong about Travis being able to ambulate for only a few seconds after the gunshot? I don't believe so, no. Can you explain what could happen to cause a different outcome? I don't understand the question. What could happen that could allow Travis to still move well and for a longer length of time? If the bullet had not uh, passed through his brain, that could change the outcome. Can you explain why you think Travis was still alive when his throat was cut? Uh, because of the large amount of hemorrhage into the soft tissue around the throat wound. That requires a beating heart. How frequently have you seen injuries with a 25 caliber weapon? Probably at least 100, 200 times. Any other questions for this witness from the jury? Follow up from the state. Sir, with regard to the, here you were being asked about the sequencing of events in terms of the bullet. If the bullet wound was the first wound that was received by Mr. Alexander, would it have been immediately incapacitating? Yes. And why would it have been incapacitating? Because of brain injury. Would there be under any medical science that you are aware of, would there be any situations uh, whatsoever where the bullet could go through the frontal lobe as you found and an individual could continue to ambulate uh, for minutes? Not for minutes. If they're already walking in a direction, um, there have been cases where those people will continue to take a few steps just because that's the motion that's already been initiated. What if there were testimony in this case that he was already on the ground at one point at the after she shot him, would he then, based on this uh, bullet wound, been able to get up under any circumstances and walk around? No. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Ms. Wilmot. that it would, um, if he was still alive at the time, that there would be blood coming from there, quite a bit of blood from there? Yes, quite a bit. All right, and you're familiar with some of the photos that there was quite a lot of blood in the entry of the hallway into the bedroom? Yes, I believe I recall that. And so is that likely where then that would have happened, based on the amount of blood? Uh, an injury of some kind happened there. I can't recall exactly how much blood we're talking about. I haven't seen the photos in some time. All right. and. From the gunshot wound, we know that uh, we talked about trajectory last time, we know, or the directionality of it. We know that it came in from the right side, correct? Yes. And that it was going downwards, right? Yes, but it may have been deflected by the skull as well. I'm sorry? It may have been deflected by the skull as well. That can change the trajectory. Because the 25 caliber can be deflected by bone? Yes. Okay. And uh, when a person receives a neck wound such as that you see in this case, that's going to make it very, within seconds, that person isn't going to be able to hold up their head, right? Yes. And in fact, they're not going to be able to sit up at all. Right. And most likely, a person with that kind of wound is going to be laying flat. Depending on where they land. I mean, they could sit in a chair like that, depending on where the body is. Well, and if they're sitting in a chair, they're going to be slumped over, right? They're not going to be able to hold their head up. Right. All right. Thank you. Nothing further. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please go back to the jury room. <clears throat> I will call you back shortly.
The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Dr. Horn, you may step down. Counsel, I would like to see you in chambers. Yes. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, the court has excused juror number eight from further participation in this case. We are going to take the recess until next Wednesday, May 1st, 9 a.m. Please be back here at that time. Between now and then, please follow the admonition. Avoid all media contact. Do not allow anyone to talk with you about the case. Are there any questions? You are excused. Have a nice weekend. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom council. Anything else for today? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We are in recess. <laughs>